Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, As-salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah. Tonight we're asking the question, for what reason did Christ have to die? We're focusing on the salvation aspect of this question and not the historical one. The study of the doctrines related to salvation is known as soteriology. To be clear, by salvation we generally mean that you will be saved, that you will go to heaven or Jannah as Muslims would say. I will begin by explaining what the Islamic beliefs are about this topic. On the first point, Muslims believe that both what a person believes and how a person lives are inextricably tied to one another. Salvation in Islam means that we put into action our beliefs and that we internalize our actions in light of our beliefs. Our beliefs inform our actions and our actions inform our beliefs. In Islam, we therefore can't have one and not the other. It is a two-way street. This teaching is summarized in Surah Al-Asr in the Quran, which reads, by the passage of time, surely humanity is in grave loss, except those who have faith, do good, and urge each other to the truth, and urge each other to perseverance. Some may think that in Islam, you simply pray every day, and automatically you get into heaven. This is not the case. Our actions in obedience to God must be based on the right intentions. Again, the emphasis here is that our actions must be informed by our faith, by our beliefs. In a prophetic teaching, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has said, verily, actions are based on intentions. If one seeks to praise and glorify God in prayer five times a day, by the standards he has set, then we are submitting to the sovereign will of our Creator. Indeed, even in the Bible, it is written in Job chapter 22, verse 21, Submit to God, and you will be at peace with Him. In essence, this is the goal of the five daily congregational prayers, and it is summarized as follows in a popular commentary of the Quran. It says, uh, To know the effectiveness of the remedy, we must know the disease. Pastor Brian spoke a lot about disease. And so we have to find out why prayer should be so burdensome. The human heart loves to roam freely in the vast spaces of thought and fancy. All the organs of the human body uh, being subservient to the heart, it requires them to be equally free. On the other hand, Salah demands the renunciation of such freedom and prohibits eating drinking, walking, and talking during the prayer. A restriction which annoys the heart and is also painful for the human organs governed by it. In short, the congregational prayer is burdensome because the heart enjoys keeping the faculties of thought and imagination in a continuous motion. Motion being the disease, it can only be remedied by its opposite, restfulness. Hence, the Holy Quran prescribes khushu, a word which we have rendered into the English by the phrase humbleness in heart, but which actually signifies the restfulness of the heart. In other words, to gain peace with God, we surrender our minds and our bodies, our beliefs and our actions to the will of our Creator. On the second point of mercy and grace, 113 chapters of the Quran begin with the Basmala, which reminds us of God's mercy and compassion upon us. In English, it reads as, in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. We are taught in the English, sorry, we are taught in the study of language that when we repeat something, it is for emphasis. And God here is communicating to us that true faith stems from his mercy and his grace upon us. Indeed, one of the most beautiful prophetic teachings is known as Hadith al-Rahmah, or the narration of mercy. It reads, the merciful will be shown mercy by the most merciful. Be merciful to those on the earth, and the one, on the, and the one in the heavens will have mercy upon you. Again, here we see that faith, which is belief in the most merciful, that is God, calls us as Muslims to be merciful 
to everyone upon the earth, an action that we are called to do. Again, faith informs action and actions inform our faith, a perfect balance. Uh, continuing, uh, where am I? Yes, when we speak of the mercy of God, we must speak of repentance. We can truly only know what goodness is when faced with the prospect of sin. That God calls us to not sin is both a belief and also an action of prohibition. It is when we are truly grieved by the wrongs that we have done, do we understand the mercy of our creator upon us and that he has given us a path through him. A path through belief and action is a mercy itself. For this we say indeed, all praise is due to God. On the third point, judgment, God reminds us in the very first chapter of the Quran that there is a day of judgment, a day of accountability. Had God wanted, it would have been possible for him to punish us immediately as we sin. Yet this is not always the case. But having said so, it is true that humanity faces difficulties in this life, the current pandemic being one such case. Yet we must keep in mind that through disasters, devastation, and death, God has not just informed us of what morally wrong actions he has prohibited, but as the most merciful, he has provided a balance to that scale. He has advised us on morally right actions that we can do to build a relationship with him. And so in the very first chapter of the Quran, we read, the most gracious, the most merciful, master of the day of judgment. You alone do we worship and you alone do we ask for help. Our judgment then is in light of our faith and in our duty to do righteous actions by the command of God. Salvation in Islam, therefore, is to be gained by professing true belief and by what God commands. Some Christians differ with this understanding. There is a belief known as sola fide. It is one of the five solas. This is Latin, this is Latin for the term faith alone. This belief is shared by my colleague, Pastor Brian. I need to be clear here. I'm raising these points of difference so that we can all come to know the true path to salvation. After all, we're gathered here today because we sincerely want to see the other being saved. The dialect then is based on love, not hatred. Neither myself nor the pastor are raising these differences to belittle, hurt, or antagonize any communities, not the less our own as well. So we can now say that faith and good actions result in salvation in Islam, Roman Catholicism, Judaism, and in the Orthodox Church. And we can also say that faith results in salvation and good actions in Christianity specifically Protestant Christianity. What we see here are two very similar paths. The foundational blocks are generally the same, faith and good actions, but there is a major difference in how we view the role of actions or works. The first difference is that our topic today is focused on Jesus. The topic literally says, uh, if Christ died, dot, dot, dot. So what we're looking for or focusing on is what Christ says about this doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Well, there are a couple of issues here. Jesus himself in the New Testament not once taught that salvation is a result of faith alone or of faith in his crucifixion alone. Someone might say that Jesus teaches this doctrine, but not in those words. Now, it is clear from the four Gospels that Jesus knew the words faith and the word alone. But we never actually find him using those words to result in the belief that faith alone grants us salvation. Uh, where am I? Now to be clear, many Christians also tend to use the word justification and they use it in the phrase justification by faith alone. To a Muslim, that may not make apparent sense. What is meant here is that some Christians believe that they are made righteous uh, by their faith alone, that they are saved by faith alone, that there is salvation by faith alone. 
luckily, we do have an instance of Jesus using the word for righteousness in a salvific context. In Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14, Jesus gives us a story of a Jew who knelt in prayer. And this Jewish man was comparing himself to people he considered less pious than him, while in, while, all this while engaged in prayer. In the same prayer space, another man who had a lowly job, a tax collector, only prayed and asked God for forgiveness without comparing himself as being better than anyone else. It is reported in these verses that Jesus then says that the tax collector was righteous and the Jew who was comparing himself to others was not righteous. In other words, the passage does not teach the doctrine of salvation, of being declared righteous by belief alone in the crucifixion. Rather, it teaches that arrogance makes a person unrighteous. Unfortunately, there is nowhere else within the Gospels that would allow us to examine this doctrine from Jesus himself. Rather, we would have to wait for the later writings of Paul to see the doctrine being taught and generally explained. So then the question occurs to us, how can so central a doctrine not have been expressed or taught by Jesus even once? This would be the first major difference. The second major difference is that we find in both Judaism and Islam and in other groups in Christianity like Roman Catholicism and the Eastern Orthodox Church, the same formulation that faith and good actions result in salvation. The Jews specifically believe in 613 commandments as given in the Hebrew Bible. The outlier would be 16th century Protestant Christianity, the tradition of which Pastor Zegers belongs to. We can then say that the dominant tradition amongst the Abrahamic faiths is that we are saved by both faith and actions. Let's see if this is what Jesus himself also could have taught. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, a young man approaches Jesus and asks a very important question. And behold, someone came up to him and said, Teacher, what good thing must I do so that I have eternal life? He's asking, what good action must I do to be saved? The Greek verb here is to do an action, the word poiso. Jesus doesn't turn around and say to him, just believe, just have faith. Instead, let's, what, let's read what Jesus' response is. As according to our working theory, just as in Judaism and in Islam and in most forms of Christianity, we expect Jesus to let him know about actions that he can do, that is actions to do to be saved. So we read from verses 17 to 19. And Jesus said to the young man, why are you asking me about what is good? There is one who is good. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. The young man said to Jesus, which ones? And Jesus said, do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother and love your neighbor as yourself. What do we see here? We see that Jesus says, keep the commandments. Do this action. Do that action. Exactly as Jews, Muslims, and most Christians believe. But what happens when Paul is asked the same question? <laughs> Does he give the same answer as Jesus? A person has imprisoned Paul and Silas, and he comes to them. We read from Acts chapter 16, verses 30 to 31. And the jailer brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do so that I can be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. His answer was to just have faith. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, Keep the commandments. Why are their answers to the same question so very different? Let's assume though that maybe I haven't proven my case. Maybe I misquoted Jesus. Well, let me give you another example. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus is speaking and he declares, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Not my commandment, singular, but my commandments, plural. He doesn't say, if you like me, if you care about me. He says, if you love me, I declare here and now tonight that I love Christ Jesus. 
I love all the prophets of God, and all the prophets obeyed God's commandments, and they were counted as righteous and saved by God. The third and final difference is that God is greater than all else. This is the meaning of Allahu Akbar, a phrase that Muslims say in times of blessings and during times of tribulations. The question may be raised tonight, how can God be fair if he punishes some sinners and not others? A fair judge after all punishes all. Yet allow me to offer you one response. If Pastor Brian, and he will never do this, was to hit me tonight, I would forgive him. I don't need to punish him in return before I forgive him. Many Christians today believe, uh, sorry, many Christians today believe that God cannot be just without first punishing the unrighteous. But where does God say this in the Bible or in the Quran? How can I be more merciful than God, that I, each as a lowly individual, can forgive without punishment? Perhaps this idea that God is not just if he does not punish people is a teaching from Jesus in the four Gospels. Perhaps Pastor Brian can show us this teaching from Jesus. Because Jesus, I know, said to turn the other cheek. He didn't say, slap him in return first, punish him first, and then turn the other cheek. This, again, is where the prophetic narration of mercy comes into play. Let me repeat it for you. The merciful will be shown mercy by the most merciful. Be merciful to those on the earth, and the one in the heavens will have mercy upon you. Thank you.